This is part two of trauma pleading course with the pen facial case example number one. We'll be using a plastic skull and perform segmented mandibulectomy, ZMC fracture creation, and bilateral Lefort 1 fractures, and I'll demonstrate how to put it all back together using hardware. First, we'll start out by marking out fractures along the angle and parasymphysis. Mark out the inferior alveolar nerve. Mark out the opposite side inferior alveolar nerve. Next, for a ZMC fracture, we'll mark a zygomedical maxillary suture line, zygomedical sphenoid suture line, zygomedical frontal suture line, and zygomedical temporal suture line along the zygomedic arch to complete the ZMC fracture. Next, mark a bilateral Lefort 1 fracture. Before we perform segmentum mandibulectomy, we need to preserve the mandible relationship. As such, we're going to perform external fixation using pins placed superior to the inferior alveolar nerve and along the external oblique line. On the opposite side, you want to place the pin outside of where the plate will be secured. Next, apply pin to rod couplings. Then connect the rods to the coupling. And lastly, apply rod to rod coupling. You want to adjust the rods away from your mandible site as well as the mid face site so that it's not going to be in your way when you are plating or making osteotomies. So tilt the rods away from the working area and tightly secure the couplings and it does require a lot of force to make sure they're super tight so it does not come loose. We'll start off by creating an osteotomy along the angle to start out our segmented mandibulectomy. When you're using the saw, you want to let the blade cut against the mandible at a perpendicular angle and let the saw do the cutting. Next, osteotomy is made along the parasymphysis. Next, for the ZMC fracture creation, we'll perform lateral maxillectomy and lateral orbitectomy. We'll begin with making an osteotomy along the zygomedical maxillary suture line, then the zygomedical sphenoid suture line, create a cut along the zygomedical frontal suture line and connect it down to the zygomedical sphenoid suture line. Lastly, cut along the zygomedical temporal suture line and complete the ZMC fracture. Next, we'll perform bilateral infrastructure maxillectomy and create a bilateral Lefort 1 fracture segment. Essentially, you'll be cutting across the palate to the level of the nasal floor on both sides. Because the model is quite thick, we'll have to make this cut twice with increasing depth of the blade as you make deeper cuts. We'll make the same cut on the opposite side. We're going to finalize a midline cut along the septum. And this will help us complete the maxillectomy with a downforce fracture. So this is what we have with segmentum mandibulectomy resulting in parasymphysis and angle fracture, ZMC fracture segment, and maxillectomy resulting in Lefort 1 fracture bilaterally. Now we're going to put everything back together. First priority is to reestablish occlusion by using maxillomandibular fixation, and we're going to be using hybrid arch bars to do that. I'll generally use 6 millimeter locking screws along the front and 8 millimeters along the molar segment. It's important to aim for the space between the tooth roots to minimize injury to the tooth roots.
Next, we'll also apply hybrid arch bar along the mandible. Similarly, 6mm screws are used along the front and 8mm screws used along the molar segment. If you're using this in a live patient, you want to make sure you cut the hybrid arch bar at the side of the fracture so that it doesn't interfere with the bone reduction because the continuity of the arch bar can cause displacement of the bone from proper reduction. And as mentioned before, if your screw is going to be in line with the tooth roots, you may have to move it out of the way to avoid injury to the tooth roots. Once your hybrid arch bar is cut at the side of the fracture, you can then proceed with rigid maximandibular fixation using 24 gauge wires. Your goal is to reestablish pre-morbid occlusion. Similarly, we'll be using 24 gauge wire to reestablish pre-morbid occlusion on the opposite side. Whenever you're dealing with multiple fractures, you always want to start out with your easiest fracture. And in this case, it's going to be right parasympathetic fracture. We'll start bone reduction by placing a bone clamp to bring the bone fracture into proper alignment. If you apply the bone clamp in this fashion, you're blocking visualization of where the place will be placed. Instead, you want to flip the clamp around so that you're not blocking visualization of where you're going to be placing the plates. And the visual reference to ensure that you have proper alignment in the parasymphysis area is the inferior border of the mandible and the plane of the bone along the fracture line. By closing the clamp, you can bring the bone into proper alignment using these visual references as your guide. Once you're properly reduced, you're then going to apply hardware. In a parasymphysis, from a biomechanical standpoint, inferior border plate is much more important. In this case, we'll be using a four-hole plate with two screws on either side of the fracture. To minimize risk of the tooth root injury, we'll be using monocortical locking screws along the superior plate. And we'll also plan on placing a secondary inferior plate below this. Now at parasymphysis, you also have the option of using just one thicker 1.5 millimeter thickness plate if you don't want to use two separate plates. The advantage to using two mini plates with locking screw is that you save a lot of time in the OR. Due to the thinness of the plate itself, it's easy to adapt the plate to existing bone. And because you're using locking screws, it does not require perfect plate adaptation to the bone to achieve proper stability. In situations without combination or segmental bone defect, I'll generally use monocortical screws along the inferior border plate. Some surgeons will prefer to use bicortical screws for the inferior plate. At the angle, superior plate is much more important from a biomechanical standpoint. In recent years, I have started to use the 6x2 ladder plate. The advantage of this is that you have two plates that are fused, so once it's secured, it's easy to apply two rows of plates. I'll generally remove the inferior most and superior most screw hole from the inferior plate so that it does not fall off the bone. So you end up with a six hole along the superior border plate and a four hole along the inferior border plate. Once the plate has been modified, it's going to help you with the plate placement and not fall off the bone itself. I'll start out by placing two screws on the superior border plate since this would be easier to visualize in a live patient. And during actual surgery, we're using a transvocal trocar system with a cheek retractor that looks like this for both drilling and screw placement. One important thing to remember while you're putting the system together is that the cheek retractor should hug the groove that act as a viewing angle to optimize maneuverability during surgery. Next, tighten the cheek retractor so that it does not come loose during surgery. As I mentioned before, I'll start out by placing two screws on the superior border plate across the fracture line to get the plate started. And because it's harder to visualize the inferior border plate, I'll then place all the screws along the inferior border plate first, and then I'll complete it coming back to place screws on the superior border plate. Once we have completed the mandible repair, we'll then proceed with the Lefort 1 fracture repair. On the left, there's both the ZMC and the Lefort 1 fracture present, while on the right side, there's only a Lefort 1 fracture present. Thus, this will be the easier fracture side to start out with. For the right Lefort 1 fracture repair, we'll start out with the medial buttress. Visual reference for bony reduction will be the piriform aperture curvature. Typically, a four-hole plate 
or an alt plate can be used in this area. I'll generally start off by securing a screw on one side of the fracture line. And you want to loosely tighten the screw to create an anchoring point so that the plate can now then be repositioned into an ideal location before the second screw can be placed. Then the second screw is placed and then the first two screws are tightened all the way down. The rest of the screws can be placed in a normal fashion. Next, we'll focus on the lateral buttress on the right side. The visual reference for bony reduction is a lateral buttress curvature and anterior maxillary sinus wall across the fracture line. Typically, an L plate is placed. First screw acts as an anchor point while the plate is repositioned before the second screw is placed. The rest of the screws are placed in the usual fashion using monocortical screws. When placing screws on the lateral buttress, you want to aim to place screws along the malar eminence and near the alveolar bone, as this area has thick bone, while centrally along the anterior maxillary sinus wall will be quite thin and inadequate for screw placement. We'll proceed with X-fix removal now that the occlusion is fully restored. By removing the X-fix, we can now gain better access to the surgical field. We'll focus on the ZMC fracture next. For most ZMC fracture, I'll recommend starting out along the lateral orbital rim along the zygomedical frontal suture line. This area has quite thick bone and is well preserved even in severe impact. By using the lateral orbital rim as your visual reference, you can start plating this area. Next, for a second plate, you're going to try to plate across the zygomedical maxis suture line for majority of the ZMC fracture. In this case, for a simple ZMC fracture such as this with good bone stock, you can use a L plate, similarly as it was repaired in the Lefort 1 fracture on the opposite side. Your visual reference is a lateral buttress curvature as well as an anterior maxis sinus wall across the fracture line. For a simple ZMC fracture such as this, with good bone stock, you may not always necessarily need a third plate along the infrabotal rim. And having just two plates along the zygomedical frontal and zygomedical maxillary suture line might be sufficient. And in that case, you might be done repairing the simple ZMC fracture. However, in more severe impact, you will have loss of bone along the lateral buttress. And we'll simulate this by drilling out this area along the lateral buttress creating a large bone gap where the zygomedical maxillary suture line is present. This is commonly seen in the elderly and people with atrophic maxillary bone. Now in this case, we do not want to continue with the ZMC fracture repair because we have lost visual reference that we would typically rely on when we're repairing the zygomedical maxillary suture site. So instead, we're going to go back to Lefort 1 fracture that was present along the medial buttress and the left side and get the mid face realigned on the left side starting with this medial buttress. In this case we'll be using an L plate to secure this area and for bone reduction we'll be using curvature of the piriform aperture as your visual reference. Now that the medial buttress has been secured we can then proceed back to the lateral buttress as part of the ZMC fracture. In a situation where you have a large bone gap, I prefer to use a ladder plate. The advantage of the ladder plate is in a situation where you don't have sufficient bone for screw placement, you have more options for adequate screw placement. In addition, the ladder plate can support the cheek skin from falling into the maxillary sinus. With placement of the ladder plate, we now have restored structural integrity along the lateral buttress, which is a major support to the midface. And as mentioned before, a third plate may be necessary in this situation because of the comminution. So a third plate is placed along the infrarotor rim to provide additional support to the ZMC fracture. And with that said, a fourth plate on the zygomatic arch is unnecessary in vast majority of the ZMC fracture, as these three plates will provide adequate support in vast majority of cases. So that concludes our repair. To summarize, we went from an intact skull to angle fracture, press emphasis fracture, ZMC fracture, and bilateral left front one fracture, we were able to repair the fracture to provide adequate support back to the mid face as well as the mandible.
These numbers seen on the diagram represents the order in which the plate was applied. If you have successfully completed the task, you should congratulate yourself for getting through a relatively challenging pen facial case. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you in our next video.